This audio lesson is being brought to you by the Tanakh Talk Network. Visit OutreachJudaism.org to purchase Rabbi Tovia Singer's Let's Get Biblical Books and other learning products. Now to our lesson by Rabbi Tovia Singer. Let us continue looking at this amazing chapter in the Bible. Remember, when we look from Isaiah 40 through 66, 27 chapters, what we're seeing there is there are three basic characters. Character number one is Israel, number two is the Gentile nations, number three is God, and the basic theme from 40 at all, Israel through its exile is low, low down, and God is going to raise up Israel from a very low afflicted state to high up, and all the nations of the world will indeed go by its light. That's the theme throughout, that's why it begins by saying, Nachmu, Nachmu, Ami, Isaiah 40, verse 1, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, declares the Lord. And verse 2 tells us why. For your iniquities have been appeased. What do you mean it's been appeased? According to Christianity, the appeasement would only come through death on the cross, through Jesus' blood on Calvary. But it doesn't say that. It says the reason why it's going to happen is because Israel has indeed received twice Double for her iniquity. What happened to the cross? Should have been there. We all went astray like sheep. This is verse 6. We have turned each one on his own way. And the Lord accepted his prayers for the iniquity of all of us. Remember, who's speaking here? The nations of the world, the kings of nations. Israel prays for the world. Prays for the nation that it lives in, and as a result, through Israel's knowledge, through its prayer, the world receives enormous benefit. And indeed, Jeremiah tells us, it encourages the Jewish people. Jeremiah lived at a really a crucial time in Jewish history. He lived at the time when the Jews were about to go into their exile. So he's going to give them advice. You're packing your bags from Anatevka. You know, it's to go, right? As you're packing your bags, he says to them, look, when you go into the nation, wherever you're going to be, pray for it to the Lord. And indeed, many synagogues, we pray for the United States of America. The Jews in Morocco, pray for that country. Section number 10. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he would not open his mouth. Like a lamb to the slaughter, he would be brought, and like a sheep that is mute before her shearers, and he would not open his mouth. Do we find other places in Scripture where Israel is referred to as afflicted? Constantly. And I've given you an example of Psalm 28, verse 18. For you will save the afflicted nation, and you will bring down the haughty look. Do we ever find a clear verse in the Bible, ever, that's clearly talking about the Messiah, where it says the Messiah is going to be afflicted, where it says the Messiah is going to be forsaken? Never. There's not one verse anywhere in the Bible that Jews or Christians agree on that's talking about the Messiah, where it says that the Messiah is going to be afflicted, or the Messiah is going to be despised. One of the things that we notice when we look at Scripture is that the righteous remnant of Israel is a theme that comes up over and over again. Indeed, I think it's clear from Scripture that throughout the ages, throughout the generations, the majority of the Jewish people would be in apostasy. That's a clear theme. And it's only a remnant that indeed participates in the covenant. The vast majority of Jews abandon the covenant, abandon the teachings of God. Look, I mean, the reason why we have to be an eternal nation is because we have an eternal message to bring to the world. That's why, if you want to bring an eternal message to the world, you have to be an eternal nation. If someone says, look, you know, I don't want to bring the message to the world, I don't want to teach Torah to the world. I don't want to be a light to the nations. Then there's no reason for you to be part of an eternal nation. Remember the story, the famous, famous story in 1 Kings 18 of what a magnificent event this must have been when Elijah the prophet stands before, before the Jewish people. So many of them had embraced Baal, but only partially. They actually were involved with Baal, this foreign god, this idolatry that we see reoccurring in the Bible so many times. But it's very clear that the Jews weren't sure. They were like into Baal, but they were into their Jewishness. It was like Hebrew Baalism or something they must have called it, you know. And indeed, 
Elijah addresses this in verse 21. He says, how long will you halt between these two religions? If you choose God, then, then accept Him and follow Him. If you follow Baal, then follow Him. Jews always had the problem of they needed the Hanukkah and you know, the cross together. They couldn't, you know, we can't, you know, can't get the Jew out of us. This is, didn't just start with Christianity. It was an old story with the Jewish people. And Elijah makes a suggestion. He says, look. Let's set up two altars on Mount Carmel. You can go to the place where it happened today. On Mount Carmel, they set up two altars. He said, I'm going to bring two bullocks. I'm going to bring two animals. He says to 450 priests of Baal, he says to them, pick one. Put it on the altar. Put wood there, but put no fire there. And I will do the same on another altar. And whichever sacrifice will be consumed by God, that's how we'll know who has the truth. And of course, first the 450 priests of Baal go there. They put up their sacrifice there. And they're screaming and chappering and they're flying around there. Nothing's happening. There's no fire. Just the animals laying there on the wood. And of course, prophetic humor is there. Elijah starts to say to them, Haha, Maybe your God is sleeping. You've got to wake him up. Yell a little louder. can hear you. They become very frustrated. These were very religious people. They believe because you'll see by the next thing they do. They take knives. They remove them and they start to slice, they start to mutilate their body, which is a way of serving their God. And they hope that in, in that mutilation, that hopefully that would bring on the fire from heaven. And of course it doesn't happen. Elijah goes and he puts the animal on top, he even makes a ditch around the altar, fills it with water and cries out to Hashem, the Almighty God. Fire comes down and consumes the sacrifice, the water. What a marvelous day that should have been for the Jewish people. I say should have been, because at that moment the Jews were all excited. Look what a wonderful thing, Scud missiles, Israel, we're all... I, I feel good now. All these missiles, not one, I'm going to make all kinds of promises. What happens the very next day, the Jews are back in their idolatry. They're back with Baal again. It's unbelievable. Elijah cries out to Hashem, he says, look at them. All the Jews are worshipping Baal. And you know what God responds? He says, oh no. God responds with two points. Point number one, it's not true. There are 7,000 that have not bowed down to him, that have not kissed his hand. There are 7,000 Jews that are righteous. Number two, you're fired. Elisha's taking over. If you think that about the Jewish people, there always will be a remnant that will be, be completely committed to my word. And that's why Elijah the prophet has to come to our brises and to our Seder tables. That's why he's there. Why? Because he thought it was over. He thought the Jewish people were finished. There's nothing left. They're all in Baal. And Hashem says, come for all generations of Bris and the baby boy. You're going to be there. You're going to see the covenant is continuing. And in a few weeks from now, you have a say table. Elijah the prophet is going to come there. He's going to see, look, the Jewish people are there. And they're continuing, both in creation and in history. There always was a righteous remnant of the Jewish people. Always was. The vast majority, apostasy. And we find many scriptures that talk about the crying out of the remnant of Israel, how they reached out to the Almighty God, because they endured, they endured with the rest of Israel the same pain, the same torment. One of the famous Psalms is Psalm 44. The righteous remnant of Israel cries out, look at the language, you have delivered us like sheep for the slaughter, and among the Gentiles you have scattered us. You made us a disgrace to our neighbors, the mockery and scorn of those around us. You made us a byword among the nations to shake their heads. Because of your sake, we are killed all day long. We are considered as sheep for the slaughter. Zechariah 11. So said the Lord my God, tend the flock of the slaughter. Section 11. From imprisonment and from judgment he is taken, and his generation who shall tell? For he was cut off from the land of the living, because of the transgressions of my people, a plague befell them. Do you remember I promised you something last week? I got up last week and I said the great tragedy of Isaiah 53. It's a grand delusion. A grand delusion by the church. But do you remember I told you something? I told you that I can show you by just examining the chapters that caress the shores of Isaiah 53 who this is talking about. And naturally we see a kid giving a King James Isaiah 53, a little track, all it has is Isaiah 53, handed a t-shirt with Isaiah 53 on it, that's all it's got, right? I maybe understand a little bit about why these people believe it. Remember I made another little promise to you? 
Remember I told you that I'm going to prove to you that even if I only had Isaiah 53 and nothing else, I can prove to you this couldn't possibly be speaking about Jesus. Do you remember how I showed you throughout the servant songs, Isaiah talks about Israel in the singular why? Corporate Israel has that. Destinies as a unit. Do you remember how I showed you how Isaiah and all the prophets, how they moved from the singular to the plural to the singular back and forth constantly? Individual Jew, corporate Israel, individual Jew, corporate Israel. Do you remember how we saw Isaiah 43, verse 11? You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. Remember that? Do you remember how we looked at Isaiah 54? It begins speaking about Israel as the woman moves into the plural at the end, servants of the Lord. Well, Isaiah does that in the 53rd chapter as well. In Isaiah 53, Isaiah moves into the plural. Take a look with me because most of you probably missed it. He says at the end, a plague befell them. Who are them? And take a guess what the King James does with that them. The words in Hebrew are, Mi pesha ami nega lamo. Mi pesha ami means for the transgressions of my people. Nega, a plague befell. Lamo. What does the word lamo mean? Them. Third person plural. By the way, how would the prophet have said him? How do you say him? What's the singular version of lamo? Lo. Lo is him. Lamo is them. Isaiah does hear what he did in 43. Now listen carefully. You could speak about a nation in the single, but you don't talk about one person in the plural. That doesn't make sense at all. Checkmate. How do you know? How do you know I'm telling you the truth? Maybe the word Lamo really means him, but we changed it. The rabbis changed it. I gave you the King James on the top of the page. That's the King James. He was he stricken. He. It has to move it into the singular. But how do you know I'm telling you the truth? Remember the technique I taught you? This is not the only place in the Bible where the word Lamo appears. 30,000 verses, it's got to be somewhere else. As a matter of fact, Lamo appears in the Bible 54 times. And ladies and gentlemen, guess how the King James translates it in all other places? Them. Only here, him. Why do you think that's the case? I'll give you an example. Let's look at the right side. I did a little of the homework for you, and I gave you some examples. Look at Isaiah 48.21. You know what Isaiah 48.21 is? It's a handful of chapters before. This is out of the King James. And they thirsted not when he led them through the desert. He caused waters to flow out of the rock for them. That's the King James. Mitsur hizilamo. Mitzur for Mark, his zeal Lamo, he brought it for, for them. Why in Isaiah 48, verse 21, does Lamo mean them, but in Isaiah 53, verse 8, it means him. Why? How do you play with our Bible? How do you change the Word of God? And if you do, as a Jew, I'm going to leave skid marks. I don't want anything to do with this cross. Now, I gave you an example from different parts of the Bible. King James. That's King James translation. I want one person to ask me a question from the examples that I gave you. I want you to show me how what I just told you was wrong. Can anyone find it? it He's asking a very good question. The whole done, Rabbi Singer, right there. I just got finished telling you that Lamo means them. And we see how indeed the King James corrupts the text of Isaiah 53 because it would not make sense to speak about Jesus in the plural. That's ridiculous. You could speak about the nation of Israel in the singular. That makes a lot of sense. I mentioned last week that those of you who have a perfunctory knowledge of Hebrew, if you look at the Ten Commandments, God speaks to the nation as one. This is a singular individual. But if we see the other examples of Lamo used in the King James, King James, so what we find is that the King James translates that word correctly in all the other places that it appears in the singular about one person. And he found the exception. And that one is, I gave it to you, it's in Isaiah 9. Ha <laughs> ha, Rabbi Singer, I see here that that's not the case. So we see the word Lamo can be translated by the King James in the singular. What is the answer to his question? Could anyone answer his question? Yes. First, the nation of Canaan. 
You got it. Anyone would know what's going on, what is the context of Isaiah 9, it not only doesn't detract it, it enforces it. What's happening there? Oh, my brothers and sisters, we have to know our Bible. What's happening in Genesis 9? What's going on there? It's after the flood. The ark has landed. Turkey, Mount Ararat. What happens? Noah gets off from the Teva, gets off from the ark. He plants grapes. And you know what he does with the grapes? He makes wine. And you know what he does with the wine? Drinks it. You know what happens when he drinks it? He gets drunk. The Bible tells us that he got so drunk, he was laying there on his bed, stark naked, drunk. It's not a beautiful scene. What happens? Noah's children, Chum, comes in, and with disrespect, he gazes on his father's nakedness. And he goes out to the brothers, and he tells them what's happening. As soon as they hear it, they grab a cloak, and they walk into the room backwards, not to disrespect their father, to gaze on him and his nakedness. And looking the other way, they cover him over. And the Almighty curses Chum. He tells us that Chum is going to have a very unusual destiny. And that is because Chum has shown such disrespect that the children of Chum, which is Canaan, Canaan came out of Chum, will always be in servitude to the children of Shem. It's a tragedy, but the former South African government, which was a, a Christian country, and of course a racist country, how could they have both? Many also, Christian white supremacists have used this verse to say, Chum is referring to the black race. That's why the blacks must be in subjugation to the white man. And this was the verse, Genesis 9.26. So what we find really is this word, Lamo, is so appropriate because it's talking about a whole nation. Now, the King James has a good excuse. In terms of literary issues, it runs well to do it in the singular. But in reality, the Lomo is perfect because it's talking about a nation. The nation that will come from Chum will serve the nation that will come from Shem. Chum never served Shem. What I did for you also was, if you turn the page I gave you, we did a little word study. Let's take a look at both sides of the page. I took one of the most well-known and respected dictionaries, the Alkalate. Um, it's a three-volume Hebrew-English dictionary. It's really an exhaustive dictionary. So I just looked up the word Lamo, and you can see it on the left side. It's poetic, and it means to them. What we're most interested is the right side of the page, because there's a rule when dealing with the Christian. If you can prove it from Christian sources, it's always juicier. It's always more effective. It's always more powerful. What are we looking here on the right side? Kohlenberger puts out this interlinear Bible based on the NIV. What's an interlinear Bible? Instead of having a regular Bible that just has the English, what it has is for those people who really are students of Scripture, and they want to see how every word is translated literally, it gives you the actual translation of the word. This is not put out by a Jew. This book is not a Jewish book. This is by a Christian. And if you take a look with me, where the arrow on the left is pointing to, you see how they translate Lamo and the interlinear? To them. This is a Christian translator. This is not you. This is based on an NIV. And if you take a look at the NIV on the right side of the page, you see there's a sidebar on the right side of the page. Do you notice that? That's the actual New International Version. Well, take a look at the other arrow. You see how the NIV handles it? For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. NIV, tell me, what do you translate as he was stricken here? And Kohlenberger puts over here that it really means them. If it means them, leave it. Why play with my Bible? Why change it? What motive do you have to play with my holy scriptures? And if you are, what does that tell me about you? Section number 12. And he gave his grave to the wicked and to the wealthy with his kinds of death. Because he committed no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Remember I showed you Lamo only seconds ago? How they take a plural and they must, it's an irritating word, it's a nuisance to the cross. And they move it into the singular, no choice, you got you got to change the Bible. The word bimosav means what? In his death, plural. How do you say in his death? Singular. Are there any Israelis here? How do you say in his death, singular? Bimoso. In his death, 
bin Mosav in his death. What do you think the King James does with now a plural of many people dying? That's not a problem. The King James just changed it back into the singular. Well, let's use the same technique we used with Lamo. Let's look up all the other places bin Mosav appears in the Jewish scriptures and we'll prove it, right? I cannot do that in this case. Do you know why? This is an exceptional word. It's the only time it appears in the Bible. So the only way for me to prove it is to sit down with someone and teach them Hebrew grammar. But Mosav is them, but Mosav is him. But if we turn back again to our good friend, the NIV interlinear translation, let's see what this Christian does with that word. It's right below the word Lamo, Bim Mosav, in death of him. And if you look on the right, you'll see the NIV, it's singular. There are two types of people that are unsafe and have to be weary of their safety. They have to be on the lookout constantly. They have to be very careful about what they do because these are people that could become hurt and could be killed because of their position. One type of person is someone who's very wealthy. If you have accumulated wealth, then people are going to want it. You have to be very careful. You have to make sure you have big gates around your house and alarm systems and dogs and bodyguards. You have to, when your kid goes to school, you got to make sure there's a bodyguard with him that no one kidnaps him and tries to get a ransom. That's one type of person that has to be careful. The other type of person is, of course, the wicked person. person is committing crimes, he has to be very careful because the law is after him. This is a person who can pay, can pay with his life. He can be killed for the crimes that he's committed. The two types of people in society that have to be very careful because they can, can be killed because of their position is the person who's accumulated a lot of wealth and the person who's a criminal, the person who's very wicked. And indeed the prophet tells us that Israel was punished and was on the run as if it was these two types of people. And he gave his grave to the wicked and to the wealthy with his kinds of deaths. Now I want someone to ask me a question about this verse. Because Christians have had an objection about this verse that it couldn't possibly be speaking about Israel. I'd like one of you to come up with that. You should look at the description of the servant and have a very big question say, if it's talking about Israel, we have a big problem. No violence, I wouldn't say. The Jewish people have never been noted for being a violent people. In general, even when we're pushed to the brink, we're going to bomb Beirut, we drop leaflets down, get out of here. We're not people that are noted in general. Perception of the world is that the Jewish people are not a violent people. I'm sure you would never think of one Italian say to the other Italian, quickly, let's, let's cross the other side of the street, there's an accountant on the corner. You know, usually that's not the kind of thing we would think about, right? No, not really. But what's, what question should you be asking me? Yes. Oh, no deceit in his mouth. <laughs> you haven't met my attorney yet, have you? <laughs> you haven't met my brother Leon. No Jews, no deceit in their mouth. That's your description. You know, I mean, inside a trap. I mean, these are where we sort of blow it a little bit, right? The Jews, now that's a hard one to swallow. Now, if it's talking about Jesus, well, the New Testament would certainly want to personify its hero as never lying. So, you know, Jesus didn't lie. There was no deceit in his mouth. But how are you going to tell me that Israel doesn't lie? Righteous Israel, they don't lie? No deceit? Nothing? No lies? Nothing? Jews? I'm not saying we're big liars. What a tragedy that they don't even know their own Bible. As I mentioned earlier to you, the theme of the righteous remnant flows throughout the Bible, and of course the righteous remnant will be there at the end of days in the Messianic Age. If you want to know, you know, what will be the character of righteous Israel? What kind of qualities can we find? What's ironic is the chapter we're going to look at right now is almost a parallel chapter of Isaiah 53. You're going to see the same language. You're going to see the description of the poor and humble afflicted Israel. What they are going to be like. Look at the language and look at the language of Isaiah 52 and 53. The daughters of Zion. Look at it. Watch with me. And I want you to look what the Bible testifies will be the character of the remnant of Israel. From the book of Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 12 through 17 and 1920. This is prophecy. And I will leave over in your midst a humble and poor people, and they shall take shelter in the name of the Lord. Here's the testimony. Listen to every word in every letter. The remnant of Israel shall neither commit injustice nor speak lies, neither shall deceitful speech be found in their mouth.
for they shall graze and lie down with no one to cause them to shudder. Here's the same language of Isaiah 52, 1 and 2. Same thing. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, rejoice and jubilate wholeheartedly, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has removed your afflictions. He has cast out your enemy, the king of Israel. The Lord is in your midst. You shall no longer fear evil. What a promise. Verse 16. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Have no fear. O Zion, let your hands not be slack. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will be silent in his love. He will jubilate over you with song. Behold, I wreak destruction upon all those who have afflicted you at that time. And I will save the one who limps. And I will gather the stray one. And I will make them a praise and a name throughout all the land where they suffered shame. Remember Ezekiel 36 verse 6, And they bore the shame of the nations. No more. Verse 20, At that time I will bring them, and at that time I will gather you, for I will make you a name and a praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your captivities before your eyes, said the Lord. What unbelievable. People don't see this. This is a parallel chapter, Isaiah 53. Same language, afflicted. O Zion, singular. People, singular, plural. There will be no deceit. The exact same words of Isaiah 53. Be no deceit found in their mouths. Nothing. That's the character of the remnant of Israel. What an amazing thing. The next verse is extraordinary. The next verse, the speakers change. As I told you, at this point, no longer are the nations of the world speaking. Now God is speaking. The Almighty God is speaking here. And by the way, this is something that all Christians and Jews agree on. And God is making a contract... Maybe I might say it as God is making a deal with the servant. He's going to offer the servant an opportunity. And he says, if the servant will do something, I will do this for the servant. If the servant will really, if you want to be a part of remnant Israel, just take your heart and make it a restitution. Do tshuva, return, understand whatever mistakes you made and turn back to God, then God will give the servant two things in return. Number one, he'll give the servant a prolonged life, have a long life. And number two, the servant will have children. The servant will see their seed. And naturally, as a result, God's purpose will prosper in their hand. How could that be talking about Jesus if Jesus is a God-man? How could God be making a deal with God if Jesus came to the world for the purpose of dying on the cross, how could there be a deal? If you'll do this, I'll do I thought it was all made out. This doesn't even make sense. If, if you'll do this, I'll do that. It can't do it. And you know what the King James does with the word if, im? He changes it to what word? To the word when. It's not if, it's going to be. Watch. Let's go to section number 13. That's Isaiah 53, verse 10. And the Lord wished to crush him. He made him ill. If his soul makes itself a restitution, he shall see. Seed, he shall prolong his days, and God's purpose shall prosper in his hand. No problem, the King James will just change that back to when. When the servant will do this, I will do that. But you know what, let's ignore that little modification for a moment. Let's examine if this could possibly be referring to Jesus. First of all, the whole notion that this is talking about God. Remember, Christians, when I say Christians, Christendom believes that Jesus wasn't just a man. They believe that he was God manifested in the flesh. He was God, eternal, co-eternal. He existed from eternity, Alpha Omega. He is God and created the world. How could God make a deal with God? Let me put you in a straitjacket for them. Not only that, how could God be a servant to God? How could the servant, the servant is subordinate to whoever God is. How could God be subordinate? How could God promise God long life? Does that make sense? And no matter how you read it, it won't work. Jesus lived, let's say, 35 years. If he lived, let's say, 35 years, he lived only half the lifespan of what David said would be the normal life of a man. 
70 years. If you're going to answer, oh, well, it means a spiritual life, how could God promise God that he's going to have a long spiritual life? He's eternal. How could God even give that to him? How could God give God a prolonged spiritual life, if you want to say that? He's God. He's been around as long as God has been around. He's going to be around as long as God. It is so absurd. It is so ridiculous. And you're going to tell me that the servant is God who's getting this present from God? Ha <laughs> ha, I'm going to prolong your life. Isn't that a nice thing? I'm sure God was very happy when God promised him that. The other promise is, you're going to have children. That's a promise. You're going to have children. There's a little problem with that. What's the problem? How many children did Jesus have? I'm not talking about the movie The Last Temptation. I'm asking you, how many children, how many children did Jesus have in the New Testament? Three, four, anyone know? As many as Paul, none, zero. As many as John the Baptist, nothing, no children. Guy reigned a bachelor all his life. No children. How could this be speaking about Jesus? How could God promise God that he's going to have children? No matter what you say those children are, why would God need something from God? How could it be subordinate to himself? How do Christians respond when you say to them, well, Jesus didn't have children? What would be the classical Christian response? Uh, it means the body of believers, the church. There's a very, very serious problem with that response. So what Christians are saying is, it doesn't mean physical children, biological children, it means the metaphoric children, the spiritual children. That's their answer. It's a reasonable answer, no? There's only one problem with that answer. What's the problem? What's the big problem? It is true that we do find something in the Bible very clearly where a, someone could have disciples, could have followers, and these people are called children, banim. That happens. We find it often. We even find the Bible saying that, banim atem, Hashem, okay, you are children to the Lord your God. You, God has children. People have followers and disciples, and those disciples in the Bible are called children. There's only one teeny problem with this. When you want to say metaphoric children, you don't use the word zera, you use the word banim, or ben, singular. Ben in the Bible can mean physical children, and we find that as well, and can also mean spiritual metaphoric children. But the word zera, when we're talking that a person has zera, and we find that many times in the Bible, it can only mean physical children, never spiritual children. By definition, the word zera means seed. It's talking about that which leaves the loins of a man. It's not talking about those people that follow his teachings. Zera only means physical children. Never does it mean someone's going to have spiritual children. That's impossible. And therefore, it's clear here that this is talking about physical children. Prove it to me. Boy, will I prove it to you. Now, one thing we can look at is, look at the, look at the right side. You see Isaiah 45, 11? This is just a few chapters earlier. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and His Maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my signs, concerning my children. You see the Hebrew? al bonai. Those are metaphoric. It's talking about God's children. Very good. Now let's go a few verses later. Not in secret did I speak, or in a land of darkness, I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. Well, we are biological children of Jacob, and therefore the words change to Zerah. But I want to show you something, my brothers and sisters, I want to show you something marvelous. I want to show you honey, something so delicious you can't imagine. There's an amazing conversation that we find in Scripture between Abraham, that was his name at the time, and the Almighty. What happens? Hashem looks at his life, Abraham, great man, and he sees, as it says in Genesis 26, verse 5, that Abraham listened to everything following everything that God had told him, and he makes a very special promise to him. What's the promise? It's called the Abrahamic covenant. It's very, very special. Promises, Abraham, listen to me, my dear, out of you is going to come a great nation. An eternal nation. Genesis 12, the nation curses Israel, I will curse them. If the nation blesses Israel, I will bless them. There's no question about what causes America's prosperity. Abraham hears this promise. He loved God. 
He trusted God, but it created confusion. He said, God, what, what, what do you mean? A nation come out of me? Hashem, I don't have children. I don't have zera. I don't have any seed. My wife, she's past the years that a woman can bear children. We can't have children together. Oh, God, I know what you mean, of course. There's a man who lives with me. He's a Damascene. His name is Eliezer. He's a disciple of mine. He's my heir. He's all we've got. He's my follower. I love him dearly. You must mean him. You must mean my son who is Eliezer, the Ben, not the Zera. He's not my physical child, but he's my spiritual child. That's what you must... Because, you know, God, my, my wife is not a young woman anymore. She can't bear children. And God turns back to him and says, No, I'm not talking about the Damascene. I'm not talking about a Ben. I'm talking about Zerah and only that which is going to come out of your loins. Listen to me. I want you to follow carefully as we read these holy verses. And I want you to look at the words in brackets and watch them come alive. You'll see the difference how Ben is used and how Zerah is used. Watch with me if you would. Let's go here to um, Genesis 15, verse 2 through 4. Here's Abraham talking. We're going to read it now. And Abraham said, My Lord God, what could you give to me, seeing that I am childless? And the son of my house, look at the Hebrew, Uven Meshech Basi, Ven, that's the key word, is the Damascene Eliezer. All I have is a Ben, that's all I have. Then Abraham said, See, to me you have given no seed. See the word there? Zera, Zara, and see, the son of my house is my heir. Suddenly the word of the God came to him saying, That one will not inherit you, none but him that shall come forth from within your bow shall be your heir. What an amazing statement. Do you see how Ben and Zara goes there? Amazing. This couldn't possibly be talking about Jesus. This is, by the way, the very promise that Hashem makes to us. Many places in the Bible where God makes promises to the nation of Israel, He says to them, look, follow Torah, it's a holy thing. He says, if you do that, these are the blessings. Look at Deuteronomy 30, 8 through 10 and 19 20. Heaven and earth as witnesses, before you I have placed life and death, the blessing and the curse. You must choose life so that you and your seed will survive. And the next verse promises, verse 20, the promise of long life. These are the very promises. Isaiah didn't, it's not the first time we see it. You see the consistency? You see the Bible has a rhythm and has a heartbeat if you follow it? Don't play with it, just follow the rhythm. It's magnificent. Listen to me, look up here. I want to ask you a question. Christianity holds that this is talking about Jesus. The servant is Jesus. Jesus says, no, Israel. According to Christianity... How will the servant, in that case it would be Jesus, how will he make people righteous? How will he vindicate people? Through what? By his blood. Very good. Very simple. The servant will vindicate people through his blood. That's good. Model one. Let's move over right here. We'll leave that right there. If it's talking about Israel and the servant Israel, how is Israel going to affect the world? Through Israel's the servant's what? If you teach Torah, it's through the servant's knowledge. So we have two parts. Either the servant is going to vindicate the just for many through his blood, or it's going to be through his knowledge. A light to the world. A light to the nations of the world. Well, let's see what the Bible says. Watch with me. From the toil of his soul he would see. He would be satisfied with his knowledge. My servant would vindicate the just for many, and the iniquities would he bear. His knowledge? Jesus vindicated the world through his knowledge? His knowledge where? Which verse is that his knowledge? His brain was crucified? No, it wasn't his knowledge, it's his blood. It was through his blood that he vindicates. Not through his knowledge. But if it's talking about the righteous remnant of Israel who's to be a light to the nations, it is his knowledge. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you that we find in the Bible two kinds of priests. It's come as a big surprise to you. Most of you thought there's only one kind of priest and I'm it. Well, no. No, you're not. Even though you're a Kohen, 
You're not the only kind of priest, the only concept of priest in the Bible. We do find the most well-known concept of priest to most people because, especially as Jews, we live, if we're a priest, we know in the synagogue, the priest is called up first to read from the Torah, to make the blessing of the Torah. That's one kind of priest. That priest has to be a patrilineal descent from Aaron. Aaron and his sons, they were priests. When the temple will be restored, we will, I'm a priest, I'm a Kohen, we will work in the temple, in the third and final temple. That's right. That's one kind of priest. But we find there's another kind of priest, because in reality, the Kohen that we all know, the Kohen that works in the temple, is really a picture of the priests of the world, which is Israel. Righteous Israel has to be a priest to the world. And that's what we find, that whenever the Bible speaks about Israel being a priest, it doesn't mean the Aaronic priest, it means the priest to the world. Just as Aaron had the responsibility of the sanctuary and bore the iniquities of the sanctuary, Israel, the priest of the world, the rabbis of the world, we are responsible for what go, what's the going on in the world. Remember, up till now, we understood Isaiah 53, we saw how the nations were speaking. But what's God's economy? Why does God use the Gentile nations to punish the Jews? And why are we bearing everyone else's sins then? It doesn't seem very fair to me, does it? Where's the ecology there? Where's the economy? Those of you social workers, there's something here called systems theory, something amazing here. We're going to see how one merges with the other. Indeed, whenever it talks about that, it always talking about Israel as a priest, because the whole world is God, and we have to be a light to the nation, a priest to the world. As a matter of fact, right before the Ten Commandments are given in Exodus 20, the chapter before, God warns us what He expects from us. And in chapter 19, God tells us something, watch with me. Exodus 19, verse 5 and 6. Now, if you obey me and keep my covenant, you shall be my special treasure among all the nations, because all the world is mine. Verse 6. You will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation to me. These are the words that you are to relate to the Israelites. Let's go to Isaiah 61, magnificent scripture. And you shall be called the priests of the Lord. It's not talking about people who come from Aaron here. It's talking about these priests, the Israel priests. Servant of our God shall be said of you, the possessions of the nations you shall eat, and with their glory you shall succeed. Instead of your shame, remember this, which was twofold, remember that from Isaiah 40 verse 2, and your disgrace, which they shall inherit twofold, they shall have everlasting joy. The job of the Jew is to be a light to the nations. That's very, very important. Because I'm going to tell you something about Jews. What makes Jews different? Are we smarter than the non-Jew? I don't know. But the one thing about a Jew, a unique character about a Jew is that a Jew has a drive to change the world. That's why I think Jews have almost a monopoly on neurosis. I mean, with neurotic people sometimes. And the reason why is because we have this amazing drive because we're part of the genetic pool of Abraham. We get it from him. He was but one. He changed the world. In the same way, we are a driven people. That's the way we are. The Jews have to change the world. There was a book written by a fellow Semite, Ernest Wagenhagen. I'm sure many of you have read it. It's called The Jewish Mistake. Very well-known book, often quoted. He says a very famous statement. He says, there are four people more than any other that have affected the way men think during the 20th century. Four people, he said, have affected the way 20th century man thinks more than any other. Does anyone know who those four people are? Einstein, Freud, Freud Marx, and Darwin. That's correct. Freud, Einstein, Marx, and Darwin. And he speaks about how he came out of the universities, you know, when they were just allowed in, suddenly they're affecting the way... My Rebbe used to say something very cute about this, in famous statements. He said, he said, Ernest says that there are four people that have affected the way 20th century men thinks more than any other. Freud, Einstein, Marx, and Darwin. Isn't it odd? Three of them are Jewish and one was wrong. But anyways, <laughs> the Jew is always going to head every movement. It's pro-choice, pro-life, Hare Krishna, we're there, we're all over the place. You know, we're one-fifth of one percent of the world's population. We're very, very small in number. You tell it to someone who's an outsider, they have no idea. 
No idea. To them, the Jews, right? I mean, in Bangladesh, you have to have a flood. 2,000 people are killed. They're on page 15. You know, if someone throws a rock in Jerusalem, it's page 1 with a picture. In order for China to get to the front page of the New York Times, they have to kill 3,000 students in Tiananmen Square with, with, with tanks. That's how they make it to the front page. The Jewish people have an amazing drive to change the world, whether it's communism, whatever it happens to be, medicine. We want to change the world. That's our drive. And when it doesn't happen, it creates enormous tension. That's the way we are. It's part of a genetic pool. That's where we come from. The prophets begged us. He said, look, you got the drive, but I want you to be not a this to the world or a communist to the world. I want you to be a light to the nations. I want you to bring Torah to the world. Use this amazing power that you have. Use what you have received from Abraham, this drive, but use it for good. Don't use it for silly things. Don't use it for things that are wicked. Use it for Torah. You're supposed to be a light to the nations. Watch with me, Isaiah 42, verse 6. I am the Lord, I called you with righteousness, and I will strengthen your hand. And I formed you, and I make you for a people's covenant, for a light to the nations. 49, verse 6, and he said, is it too light for you to be my servant, to establish the tribes of Jacob, and to bring back the besieged of Israel? But I will make you a light to the nations. And we talked about, someone asked the question last week, how could the servant be Israel? How could Israel save Israel? And we looked at Isaiah 43, verse 7 and 8, where it says, those that call on the name of the Lord, they're going to reach out to those who have ears but don't hear, those who have eyes but don't see. And they're going to bring them back. It's the obligation of a Jew to reach out. Not to say, I had this education, you go to, you belong to a different denomination, you're nothing. Oh, you have to show them love. And the nation shall go by your light, and the kings by the brilliance of your shine. What is light? What is light? Proverbs tells us. For the commandment is a candle, and the Torah is light. Kiner mitzvah v'torah or. Very simple. The Jewish people have the obligation to affect the world. And we know at the end of days, and I've said this before, remember? There's two possibilities. Jesus is the Messiah or he isn't, right? Two scenarios that are going to unfold. It's going to happen. Maybe soon. We don't know. What's going to happen? Scenario number one, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus comes, right? What are the Jews going to do? Right? Guys, sorry. I know we've made you, you know, we've been a fly in the ointment. Sorry, teach us about Jesus. Teach us about predestination or teach us about the rapture. Teach us about Christianity. Teach us about, teach us. This is something we don't know. Teach us. Scenario number two is that Mashiach comes and boy, he is in Jesus. And the nations are going to come to the Jews and say, Oh boy, what did we do? And as you know, when we look at prophecy, we see it's always the Gentiles coming to the Jew. Say, take us with you, if we've heard that God is with you. As we see in Zechariah 8, verse 23. Why are they coming to us? If we're wrong about Jesus, we're the last people on earth they should be coming to. Now understand the parallelism between the priest, the Kohen of the sanctuary, and the priest of the world. The temple is a picture, is a type of the world. Just as Aaron was a priest in the sanctuary, and his job it was to affect the goings on of that sanctuary, that sanctuary is a picture of the world. Israel too are priests, and we are priests to the world. And the Bible tells us that Aaron was responsible for the iniquities that took place. He had to bear the iniquities of the sanctuary. And in the same way, Israel has to bear the iniquities of the world. And God said to Aaron, you and your sons and your father's house with you, you must bear the iniquity against the sanctuary. You and your sons must bear the iniquity against your priesthood. Israel too. Because we indeed are responsible for what goes on in the world. You have to know something. That if a, if a Jew sins, it takes away from the light of the world. If you do a mitzvah, it's hard to believe. But if you'll go home tonight and do a mitzvah, it nurtures something called tikkun ha'olam, the perfection of the world. The whole world benefits from it. It's an amazing thing. If you'll tomorrow morning, you put on tefillin and you'll say beautiful words, you'll keep that mitzvah tonight before you go to sleep. Say a Deuteronomy 6 voice, say the Shema. It's a mitzvah from the Torah to say that when you lie down and when you get up. Do you know the whole world will gain from that? See, what happens is when Israel sins, it doesn't just affect Israel. The whole world spiritually comes down, the light is diminished. What does that do to the nations of the world? Spiritually, the whole world comes down when Israel sins. It doesn't just affect Israel, the whole world comes down. What happens when the nations of the world come down and they're in sin? What do they do when they sin? They persecute the Jewish people. That's why God doesn't use hurricanes and typhoons and earthquakes to punish the Jews. He uses the Gentiles. It's a perfect ecology.
When Israel sins, the whole world comes down. The priests sin, they bear the iniquity of the world. The whole world spiritually comes down. When the world comes down, what do they do? They turn to sin. What do the Gentiles do? They persecute the Jewish people. It's an incredible system. The promise, of course, is at the end of days that all the nations will come in Isaiah chapter 2, and many nations shall go, and they shall say, Come, let us go up to the Lord's Mount. I mean, what an amazing thing Christians believe in something called the rapture. Thessalonians 4. The body of believers are going to be sucked up into the clouds, and what's going to happen on earth will be judgment for the non-believers. Hell, the lake of fire. It's not going to happen at all. It's unknown. This is an unknown concept in the Bible. Oh, no. Gentiles and Jews together are going to serve God. People who are not a part of it, they're not going to all be crushed to death. No, that's silly. Where out of Zion shall the Torah come forth. Zion? The Torah? Torah? What do you need Torah for? I thought we have Jesus. Jesus fulfilled the law for us. We don't have to keep the law. Finally, section 15, Therefore I will allot him a portion in public, and with the strong he shall share plunder, because he poured out his soul to death, and with transgressors he was counted, and he bore the sin of many, and interceded for the transgressors. We've seen so much scripture on this. I just gave you one more. It's just a parallel of the scriptures we've seen. How Israel indeed bore the shame of the world. At the end of days, we see there in Ezekiel 34, they bore the shame of the nations. But at the end of days, of course, Israel will no longer bear the shame of the nations. What do Christians do with what we just all learned? What are the responses of the church? How do they respond? You should know that there are two rules about the responses by the church that are almost always brought to Isaiah 53. Rule number one is they're almost never biblical. The response the church has always used is almost in all cases goes to secondary texts, homilies. Very rarely will the response be from the Bible. That's rule number one. Rule number two is a little more problematic that they always point to the conspiracy theory of the Jews. The protocols of the elders of Zion. That whole notion that the Jews are capable of a mass conspiracy. You will always find that flavor underscoring the responses that the church has. And I'd like to go through the most prominent responses that they have in the order that they are used in. This is the most popular one. What are you trying to tell me here? That this Isaiah 53 is speaking about Israel, the nation in the singular? Come now. Everyone knows that was an invention of the rabbis. The rabbis got together, they conspired. It began with Rashi, the father of the Jewish commentators. Rashi was born in the year 1040, and he went to be with the Almighty in the year 1105. Rashi, according to Jewish tradition, was passing on the Mesorah, the transmission directly from the prophets. Rashi invented this, and everyone knows that. Oh, and this is used over and over again. Moshe Rosen in his book called Yeshua, Arnold Fruchtenbaum in his book called Jesus Was a Jew. Oh boy, you can line them up. Rashi invented this and the rabbis conspired. They all got together and they all said, sure, of course that argument fulfills both criteria that I shared with you earlier. You should know that there is no relationship between that statement and truth. You might as well say that the Jews ritually need the blood of Christian boys for their mat, because that's how true that is. It's simply a lie. Well, you better prove it, Rabbi. So, what I did was I said, you know what? Let's find some texts that are a little older than Rashi. So I found the Zohar as an example. Come, consider the congregation of Israel, section 16, how it is called a lamb. As it said, like a lamb to the slaughter, he would be brought like a sheep that is mute before his shears, and he would not open his mouth. Why was it mute? Because while other nations ruled of it, it was deprived of speech and made mute. Well, maybe the Zohar isn't good enough for you. How about Midrash Rabbah? It's a lot older than Rashi. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. It comes from the book of Song of Songs. Because the Israelites poured out their soul to die in the captivity, as it is said, because he poured out his soul to death, and with transgressors, he was counted, and he bore the sins of many and interceded for the transgressions. Well, we just read that. Wait, what? Mitzvah Shabbat is a little older than Rashi. A lot older than Rashi. And not by two centuries, a lot more than that. Well, maybe that's not good enough for you. How about the Talmud? Babylonian Talmud, Brachot, page 5a. 
If the Holy One, blessed be He, is pleased with any man, He crushes him with painful sufferings. For it is said, and the Lord was pleased with him, hence He crushed him by disease. It's not talking about one person individually, it's talking about righteous people. I've heard one of the doozies are the Targum Yonatan, 2nd century. He certainly says that Isaiah 53 is speaking about the Messiah. What they will always do with you when they show you Targum Yonatan, it's like, you know, they show you one side, but they don't show you the other. They'll just show you Isaiah 52, verse 13 through 15. They'll never show you Isaiah 53, verse 1 through 12. Why do you think Arnold Fruchtenbaum does that in his book? He would never show you Isaiah 53 because once he starts speaking about Isaiah 53, the one who, stu- the one who is suffering is in Aramaic the Tzadikah, the righteous one. I always ask Christians when they bring up Targum Yonason, did you ever read it once in your life in the original fully? Once? Never had yes for an answer. I read it somewhere. You like taking someone's word for it, I say. Indeed, by the way, you should know, there are Midrash, which means these are not commentators, but these are homilies. They're not authoritative, but they are Jewish traditions, and like a homily, like a rabbi would stand in a synagogue and teach, there were midrashim that taught that Isaiah 53 is speaking about the Messiah. That must come as a very big surprise to you. Here we spent, Rabbi, I didn't even see the Oscars last week, because this, now you tell me this, that's a very serious problem. I could have seen that, hey, Tom Hanks, I heard he had an amazing speech, I missed it because of you, now you tell me this at the end, what? Because you don't understand what that word Messiah means. Sure, many of you have heard of the term, the Messiah, the son of Joseph, Mashiach ben Yosef. You may have heard of that teaching, whether you've seen it in scripture, whether you've read about it in rabbinic writings, but you never understood what it meant. I want to ask you a question. If I put myself in a time machine, and I suddenly was shot back to biblical times, suddenly I come out of the time machine, and there I am on the streets of Jerusalem, everyone's walking around in their pajamas, and there I am. 3,000 years ago, biblical times, the prophets are all there, people are walking around with their donkeys and so on. I tap someone on the shoulder and I say, excuse me, where is the Messiah? What will that person respond? What will that person ask me? Which one? Rabbi, now I'm really confused. What do you mean, which one? I knew there's one Messiah coming at the end of days. The Messiah, capital M. It's a very big mistake because we have to understand that the language of scripture and rabbinic writings is different than the language we use today. Let me explain. The word Mashiach, which is the Hebrew Messiah, is Latin, Christos is Greek. The word Mashiach appears in Tanakh in the Jewish scriptures. How many times? 39 times. That word appears 39 times. And you should know that if you look in all the places where it appears, that person is never the person who you and I refer to as the Messiah. The term Messiah in our English, in our language, is a post-biblical term. In days of old, they never refer to the person who's going to come at the end of days from the house of David as the Messiah. He is referred to many times in scripture, but he is never called the Messiah, ever. The person is a king. All the kings were all anointed, every one of them. The priests, anointed. We find hundreds of the use of Mashiach in Leviticus, used about the priests. They were anointed. The leaders of the Jewish people, they were anointed ones. Even Israel is referred to in Habakkuk as anointed ones. I think it's chapter 3, verse 18. When you read rabbinic literature, you better know how to read it. If you don't, don't waste your time. It takes a little training. The rabbis used the language of the Bible. They did not use the contemporary language of 20th century Jew or Gentile. The Bible, when it speaks about a Mashiach, it is not talking about who we call the Mashiach. It's a small m, indefinite article. When we say the Messiah, we today, in our language, we restrain that word and we give it a non-biblical meaning. And that is the person who's going to come at the end of days. Isaiah chapter 2, he shall rebuke many nations. Let's say the Messiah will rebuke many nations. In Isaiah chapter 11, it says that he's going to come from the shoot of Jesse. And God's going to put on him the spirit of knowledge and wisdom and the fear of the Lord. 
But it never says that he's the Mashiach, the Messiah, ever. So you have to understand when the rabbis used the word Mashiach, they were using a language that is extinct today. It is a language of the Bible. The only place it really is alive and well is in the houses of study of the Jewish people. It doesn't exist outside of the base Hamedrash. So when you read a rabbinic lie writing and it says Mashiach, that does not tell you it's talking about Mashiach, the house of David. What missionaries do is, they take rabbinic literature that says it's talking about Mashiach, and they say it must be that one because it's speaking to people who don't have the knowledge to discern. You have to understand that the plain understanding of Isaiah 53 has always been the case. Ein mikra yotze elemi de pshuto. A verse does not go out of its meaning. It's only to be understood by its plain meaning. That is the basic meaning of a verse. But the rabbis told us, and we see it in the book of Ayvadja, Obadiah, we see that there's someone from Joseph, and we see there's someone from David. These two people at the end of days, these two people are going to come together, and they're going to be like a fire to Esau, to Edom, the enemies of the Jews. Who is this Joseph who's going to do this in Obadiah? The last verse of Obadiah, V'olu Mashiim Baharzian Lishmoit is Harasov, and the saviors will go up. Who are saviors? Who are they? Who are these people? The Bible tells us that at the end of days in this great war, what's going to happen is it'll be a victory for the Jews, but there's going to be someone, a great person, who's going to be killed. It's going to be a great morning in Jerusalem. Very bad. The Jewish people, it's going to be like a victory. Remember the Entebbe raid. Yoni Netanyahu, one very special, particularly unusual person of enormous character, gets killed. The world just focuses in on that person dying. What's going to happen at the end of days is that this one man who's a righteous man that is in this great war, he's going to get killed. Why is that important? Because when the world is going to see it, there's going to be two responses. Israel is going to repent as a result of seeing this great man dead in the gates of Jerusalem. The rest of the world is going to see this individual, and this individual will come to personify Israel, the suffering Israel. When the rabbis spoke about, that's talking about Mashiach, they knew it's talking about Israel. What they're saying is that at the end of days, there's going to be one personality where all the sufferings of the Jewish people are just going to be focused in on. Because sometimes it's very hard, six million, that's a very big number. I can't cry over six million. Do you ever cry over six million? No. I cry when I see a shoe, a child's shoe, then I cry. How come six million is more than one child's shoe? One and a half million children, I can't. Anne Frank, I can relate to. One little girl. Read her diary and I can weep. Does it mean that no more than one little girl, one little teenage girl was murdered? No. A third of the Jewish people was murdered. But we focus in on one individual, and that one individual comes to represent the sufferings of all the Jewish people. But tragically... These people take advantage of the ignorance of our people. They have no idea how to look and understand rabbinic writings, these homilies, of what the, they're trying to say there's another vision here. They have no idea. Think about this for a moment. This whole Christian argument, what is it really saying? What it's really saying is, everyone always knew Isaiah 53 was speaking about the Messiah. Everyone knew that. It always was. We're never talking about Israel. What happens is the rabbis, if they, the rabbis didn't want the Jews to believe in Jesus. They were terrified that if they're going to see Isaiah 53 and they're going to say it's the Messiah, they're going to believe in Jesus. So the rabbis changed it. They conspired together and they changed Isaiah 53 to now be speaking about Israel. Isaiah 53 was always speaking about the Messiah. Everyone knew it. The rabbis changed it because they did not want the Jewish people to accept their Messiah. That's one possibility, okay? So everyone knew the Messiah is supposed to suffer and die. Everyone saw Isaiah 53. Every Jew knew that Isaiah 53 was speaking about the Messiah. But the rabbis came and changed it, said it's speaking about Israel. Okay, that's scenario number one. Scenario number two is it's just the opposite. Everyone knew that the Messiah, the son of David, was not supposed to die. It never dawned on anyone that the Messiah, the son of David, is ever to suffer, ever to die. There's no scripture for it. It has nothing to do with Judaism. Everyone knew that Isaiah 53 was speaking about Israel. It wasn't speaking about the Messiah, the son of David. Everyone knew that. What happened? Along comes Jesus, he's supposed to fulfill all these things. World peace, he doesn't do it, he dies, he gets killed. The followers still want to make it work. They don't want to let go. So what do they do? The Christians go, and they take Isaiah 53, which everyone knew was not talking about the Messiah. It never dawned on a Jew that the Messiah was supposed to suffer and die. The church now took this and changed it to be speaking about the Messiah. We can actually find out which one was true. <laughs> How do we do it? The New Testament slips. How does it slip? 
There's a little conversation that Jesus has with his disciples. And he says to them, shortly, I'm going into Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer many things. And I'm going to be killed. And I'm going to be put in the tomb. I'm going to rise on the third day. If it is true that everyone understood Isaiah 53, that the Messiah is supposed to suffer and die, that was always the case. So all the disciples should have said, well, we know it's coming. You know, that's what had to happen. We know we have Isaiah 53. It's in our nose, right? If everyone always knew that the Messiah was never supposed to suffer and die, that comes as a very big surprise. Far be it from you. That should not happen to you. That's exactly what happens in the New Testament. Look at this little conversation that takes place. Take a look at section number 22. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how? That he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes. And be killed and be raised again in the third day. Well, that sounds good. That's Isaiah 53 right there, right? Jesus said, fine. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying, be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. What do you mean this should not be unto you? He should have said, of course, I understand. Some Christians might try to argue, well, Peter didn't know that he was the Messiah. Not possible. Peter was the one who said, thou art the Christ. When everyone else got it wrong, and then Jesus says, therefore you will be the rock, and the church will be built on you, and the keys of heaven will be given to you. And the Catholic Church have used that verse to show that Peter was the first pope. Don't mention that to a messianic. They're not into that. So why is Peter so surprised? He knew what the Messiah is. He knew he was the Messiah. He should say, far be it from you. Why far be it from you? Isaiah 53. Oh no, no one knew Isaiah 53 was talking about the Messiah. It's Israel. That's why it was an enormous surprise. Let's go to our next Christian argument. We're not finished. Another argument the church has used goes like this. I don't know if you know what the Haftorah is. Have you ever heard the Haftorah? I'm sure many of you have. Everyone's smirking. What do you think, I'm an idiot? Okay. All right. Okay, I'm sorry. What's the Haftorah? If you go into a synagogue, Jewish synagogue, that is, on Shabbos, so you'll see that every week a portion from the Torah is read, and it's done in a way that by the time we finish a year, we finish all the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, the law of Moses. But you'll notice... The person who gets an aliyah, who's brought the Torah at the end, he gets maftir, and what does he do? He reads from a segment of the prophets. So the prophets are read as well in the sanctuary, not just the five books of Moses. The Jews read the five books of Moses, and they read the prophets as well in the sanctuary. And guess what? You know what those rabbis did? <laughs> they made sure that Isaiah 53 wouldn't be in the prophets. They made sure that no one would ever read Isaiah 53, because imagine, if it's in the prophet, you know, it gets a lot of attention. They didn't want the Jewish people to accept their Messiah, so they came together and said, look, Isaiah 53 is out. I don't even have to ask you how many people have heard this one. There's a Yiddish saying, is hotnish kan kop and is hotnish kan shvans, which means it doesn't have a head and it doesn't have a tail. Sometimes I don't even know how to respond, because I don't even know where to begin. Let me try. The basic assumption is, just like we read the five books, we we'll read through the whole prophets, and we just skip Isaiah 53. Actually, we read a very small segment of the prophets. It's only about 7% of all of the prophets are read in the Haftorah. Very small segment. It's not that we just, that's the only chapter we don't read, but what becomes even more bizarre, why do we read a certain portion of the prophets at a certain week when we read the Torah? What's the reason? There can be two explanations for why a particular Haftorah is said on a certain Shabbos. Two-thirds of Haftorahs are read because there's an enormous parallelism between what is read in the five books of Moses and what is read in the Haftorah. One-third is read because it's a certain time of the year. Something is happening, holidays, whatever it is, or it's a certain time of the year, and therefore we read a Haftorah that relates not to the segment of the portion of the week, but it relates to the concept, the spiritual concept that Israel is enduring at that time. As an example, when between the saddest day of the year, which is Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of Av, the day which the first and second temple was destroyed, on those seven weeks, we read a segment called the Shiva D'Nechamto, the seven weeks of consolation after Tisha B'Av. We want to read readings that console us. And could you imagine what we read from? It's right here. We read actually from Isaiah 40 throughout. We don't read all of it, but we read segments of it. As you can imagine, as we've seen, oh boy, uh, you read those prophecies and it makes your heart melt. It comforts the Jewish people. And we begin because Isaiah 53 has nothing to do with comforting the Jewish people. What it is is a narration of the Gentile nations. It has no relationship to a time of the year. And it certainly doesn't have a relationship to any part of the five books of Moses. But ladies and gentlemen, there's something even more bizarre here. 
How did we come to read the Haftarah? Why do we do that all together? You have to know a little history. Once you realize why we do it, you'll realize the absurdity of this argument. We started reading the Haftarah because under Antiochus Epiphanes IV, he was a Greek emperor, he was the villain in the story of Hanukkah. He ruled from 175 BCE to 163 BCE. And he outlawed the reading of the five books of Moses in the synagogue. You weren't allowed to read from the five books of Moses. He allowed the prophets, he didn't allow the five books of Moses. And actually soldiers were sent into synagogues to make sure that no one would read from the five books of Moses. So what the Jewish people did was, they took these segments of the prophets and they read them instead. And this tradition continued. We're not a people that break tradition. Silly argument. We started reading the Haftarah long before Jesus. Never changed it. No community ever read Isaiah 53. There are communities of Jews, by the way, who've never seen a Christian in their lives. Yemenite Jews. There's no Christians in Yemen. They weren't considered monotheists. It was Muslims and Jews. That was it. No Isaiah 53 in there. There's no Haftarah with Isaiah 53 because it has no relationship to any segment the portion of the five books of Moses. And it's not a direct... And what is even more ridiculous is if we look at... We see the Haftarah is mentioned in the New Testament. Take a look inside the study guide with me to section 23, please. In the book of Acts, it actually tells us they were reading... Look at verse 14. And went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after reading of the law and the prophet, and it says there the prophets which are read every Sabbath day. This is in the New Testament. So obviously, the Torah, it precedes Jesus. I want to show you something else marvelous. I mentioned earlier something, and I'm going to repeat it, but in a different application, that when you want to prove something, you want it to have an enormous impact on the listener, prove it from their position rather than yours. I, mean, I can show you Talmud, I can show you these things, don't worry about that. How about a Christian? What do you mean? Let me explain. One of the most important, perhaps the most important Greek church father, his name was Origen. There's a legend that he had a Jewish grandmother, that he was Jewish. It's a very religious man. He actually castrated himself based on Matthew 19, where it says if something offends you, cut it off. So he did it. Origen wrote a number of things. He, of course, wanted to merge together Greek thought with Christian theology, and he succeeded. One of his most important works is a book called Origin Contra Selsen. By the way, this church father lived in the second century. That's how early we're talking about it. He writes a book called Origin Contra Selsen. What does that mean? Who was Selsen? Who was this person? Well, his name was Celsus. Who was he? He also lived during the second century. He was a pagan scholar. Sometimes that comes as a surprise to people. Pagan? How can you be a pagan? You worship tree stumps and cockroaches? You're a scholar? I mean, what are you going to be a scholar? Well, you know, Greek mythology had a lot of depth to it, and it's not, it was rather sophisticated. He was a pagan scholar, and therefore was very anti-Christian. And he actually wrote a book called Selsum on the True Doctrine. He writes this book during the second century. It's an important book because it tells a lot about what Christians were saying by what he responds to. And he, this whole book is dedicated as an anti-Christian book. And he attacks Christianity and he sh wants to show that the claims of Christianity have no basis. What happens? Origen is this Greek church father and he wants to show why everything that Selsum was saying was wrong. So Origen writes another book called Origen Contra Against Selsum. In this book, he takes the arguments and he shows why he believes they're wrong. But in this book, he not only does that, but he also tells about his conversations with Jews. Take a look at 23a. Eh? What he tells us is that he goes to these Jews who he considered learned men. They were considered learned Jews, okay. scholars. Second century. This is a little before Rashi, nearly a millennia before Rashi. This is a Christian. He had no benefit at all for trying to support anything Jewish. And he goes over to these people that were considered learned, Jews, and he tells them Isaiah 53. The little Jews for Jesus running around, huh? He tells them Isaiah 53. And what did the Jews respond? Everyone knows the Jews say that that's talking about Israel in the singular. Second century, what happened to Rashi? This is from a Christian. What was his motive for lying? Just we're going to read a couple lines here. I remember that once in a discussion with some whom the Jews regard as learned, I used these prophecies. These prophecies means Isaiah 53. At this, the Jews said that these prophecies referred to the whole people as though a single individual. 
Oh, but Arn Fruchtenbaum says that Rashi invented this is second century. What's going on here? Who's lying and why are they? Some people have said to me, Rabbi, maybe it just comes down to Christians believe that Isaiah 53 is speaking about Jesus and Jews think it's speaking about Israel. Let's leave it at that. That's basically what it comes down to. Not true. There are many Christian scholars that agree with the Jews that Isaiah 53 obviously is speaking about Israel. What? I don't think I heard you, Rabbi. Repeat that. There are many mainstream Christian scholars that agree that see the obviousness of Isaiah 53. It's not that they're not Christians. They believe in Jesus, but they say, look, it's obvious that Isaiah 53 is speaking about Israel. Who are they? Some Ubangi scholar somewhere? No. Talking about mainstream. And what I did was I, I just gave you two examples of it. Section number 24. It's the New English Bible. You get the leather bound one, it has a big gold cross, a big gold cross in the front of the book. I always like to show it to someone. For this. this is not it's Old Testament, it's got the whole thing. It's not Jewish. Now, I'm interested in the commentary, clearly. We're interested in the bottom. What are these scholars saying? Well, I want to draw your attention to the left side, page 788. Do you see where it says, fourth servant song? These are not Lubavitcher Hasidim. Follow, please, with me. Listen to what these Christians are saying. The suffering servant, Israel, the servant of God, has suffered as a humiliated individual. However, the servant endured without complaint because it was vicarious suffering. Nations and kings will be surprised to see the servant exalted. Remember that? The crowds, pagan nations, among whom the servant Israel lived, speak here. Remember that? saying that the significance of Israel's humiliation and exaltation is hard to believe. The death probably first the destruction and exile of Israel. The theme of 52.13 is resumed. Israel, which has suffered for all mankind, will now be granted her rightful place. Long life and children's children are the signs of final vindication before God. What's going on here? These are Christians. Why are they saying this? What kind of Christians? Maybe the Unitarians, you know, they're not real Christians. I would suggest that you open up a New English Bible and open up the front page and just look which denominations participated in this. The Baptists, Catholics, Methodists, Lutheran Church, they had no motive for supporting this, but they looked and said, let's be honest, this is clearly referring to Israel, let's not fudge it. This is another one you may have never heard of, it's a very rare, people rarely, have you ever heard the Revised Standard Version? The fourth servant song, we remember that, page 889, the other side. God will exalt his brutally disfigured servant Israel to the numbed astonishment of the world's rulers. I want to read an essay written by a Christian. It had a lot of meaning to me when I read it for the first time. Leo Tolstoy, what is a Jew? This question is not at all so odd as it seems. Let us see what kind of peculiar creature the Jew is, which all the rulers and all the nations have together and separately abused and molested, oppressed and persecuted, trampled and butchered, burned and hanged, and in spite of all this is yet alive. What is a Jew who has never allowed himself to be led astray by all the earthly possessions which his oppressors and persecutors constantly offered him in order that he should change his faith and forsake his own Jewish religion? The Jew, that sacred being who has brought down from heaven the everlasting fire and has illuminated with it the entire world. He is the religious source, spring and fountain out of which all the rest of the peoples have drawn their beliefs and religions. Last paragraph. The Jew is the emblem of eternity. He whom neither slaughter nor torture of thousands of years could destroy. He whom neither fire nor sword nor inquisition was able to wipe off the face of the earth. He who was the first to produce the oracles of God. He who has been for so long the guardian of prophecy and who transmitted to the rest of the world. Such a nation cannot be destroyed. The Jew is as everlasting as eternity itself. That's tonight's lecture. Thank you. And thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you.